Okay, uh, Ezekiel chapter 43. Now notice the first word here is afterward. So the question is, is after what? Well, in the previous three chapters, Ezekiel has been given a vision of, uh, of a future temple, and the temple in which worship will be held during the millennium, or that thousand-year reign when Christ sets up the kingdom here on earth, and Jerusalem will be the center of all the world. And so what we have here is that which he's going to see after he saw the uh, detailed description of the building of the temple. In these next three chapters, we have mostly procedures of worship. And uh, I don't uh, understand all of it uh, and just the reason for all of it. But we're just going to pick out a few portions of Scripture and uh, see what the Lord has for us there. So we'll uh, start by reading chapter 43, and uh, we'll read down through the seventh verse. Afterward he brought me to the gate, even the gate that looketh towards east. And behold, the glory of the God of Israel came from the way of the east, and his voice was like a noise of many waters, and the earth shined with his glory. And it was according to the appearance of the vision which I saw, even according to the vision that I saw when I came to destroy the city. And the visions were like the vision that I saw by the river Kibar, and I fell upon my face. And the glory of the Lord came into the house by the way of the gate, whose prospect is towards east. So the Spirit took me up and brought me into the inner court, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house. And I heard him speaking unto me out of the house, and the man stood by me. And he said unto me, Son of man, the place of my throne and the place of the soles of my feet where I will dwell in the midst of the children of Israel forever in my holy name shall the house of Israel no more defiled, neither they nor their kings uh, by their whoredoms nor by the carcasses of their king in the high places. And there's one little phrase that's of interest to us here in the middle of the seventh verse where it says, where I will dwell in the midst of the children of Israel forever. The uh, Old Testament is uh, concerns itself with a theme throughout the Old Testament. And this theme is that God will dwell among the people of this earth and the center of the people of earth will be a particular nation. And this story uh, follows all the way through. And we're going to see in our uh, Bible study week after next some significance here. And you might say that the theme of the whole Bible is God dwelling among man. God is holy, man is sinful. And, but God has a way for sinful man to come into the presence of a holy God, and he wants to have fellowship with man. And the whole Bible is really the story of how God will bring this about. That is, how he will be able to live among his people. Now, this theme is brought out in the very first book of the Bible. It emphasized quite a bit in Exodus, particularly when we speak of the tabernacle. For instance, in Exodus chapter 25, he says that's the reason for the building of the tabernacle in the wilderness, that he might dwell among his people. <coughs> the uh, book of uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6 applies this theme to the church, of, uh, uh, which is the God's people of this particular age. And then in the book of Revelation, the last two chapters uh, speak of God with man. And you remember that one of the names of Jesus was Emmanuel. He was told, Thou shalt call his name Emmanuel. Uh, that being interpreted is God with us. So God wants to be among us. And this uh, uh, series of chapters here is about how God can dwell, a holy God can dwell among sinful man during the millennium. Now, some people are surprised to find out that uh, there will be sinners in the millennial reign or in that coming kingdom. Well, as near as we can understand the scriptures, everybody who enters into the kingdom at the beginning of the thousand years, everyone who takes up uh, his place in that kingdom will be a saved person because the unsaved will have been weeded out. But uh, those people uh, will bear children. Now, that's not us. We will have already been glorified. We will be a heavenly people at that time. Now, we'll have to do with the earth, but the earth won't be primarily our residence. But there will be an earthly people uh, all during this millennial reign. And they'll bear children. The children, in uh, fact, is will uh, live uh, to be a, a ripe old age. 
uh, the Bible seems to indicate that it'll take a hundred years just to grow into adulthood. That uh, because it says a child, uh, if he, if a person dies at a hundred years of age, he'll die as though he was a child. So the life processes uh, will be uh, uh, slowed down considerably. And uh, the only way a person can die during this wonderful millennial reign is uh, in direct defiance of the king. But although uh, man will not have Satan to tempt him because Satan will be bound for that thousand year period and, period, and although they won't have the world system to lure them into uh, worldly things, they'll still have that selfish nature, that old nature, the people that were born, and they must come to Christ of their own volition. God doesn't force anyone to come to him. And approximately, probably percentage-wise, approximately the, about the same amount of people will be saved during the millennium as are saved now. That would mean the great majority of people that's born in the millennium just won't, uh, won't be saved. And uh, the, the evilness in their heart will be manifested when Satan is, is loosed at the end of the thousand years and he can inveigle them to rise up against the, the righteous king and uh, uh, thereby show the actual uh, place or the actual attitude of their heart. So this is our basic theme in the, in the whole Bible and particularly in the book of Ezekiel. God will dwell with his people forever. Now we have uh, this story of the glory of God entering in uh, by way of the east gate of Jerusalem. This will be at the beginning of the millennium, and we found that this glory of, uh, of God is actually the glorified Christ. And we find this by some of the language, particularly uh, this uh, language in the second verse where it says, His voice was like the, the noise of many waters. And then again in verse 7, uh, verse 6, there was a man that stood by him. In verse 7, uh, he said, This is the place of my throne and the place of the soles of my feet. Well, now, there are two things that we learn about the Christ from Old Testament prophetic scriptures. Number one is he'll be the king. That's what his name Messiah means. He'll be the king. He'll be on the throne. And all of the New Testament spokesmen said that that Jesus is God's Christ. The first time you see all three names of Christ linked together, that is, the Lord Jesus Christ, you see it in the second chapter of the book of Acts where Peter says, This same Jesus shall God make both Lord and Christ. That gives the sequence. He, he was Jesus uh, primarily when he walked on this earth. He's Lord now, and he's the coming Christ. So uh, it's, the, it's the man Jesus who is the Christ. That's the theme for instance, of the little book of First John. Uh, anybody that confesses that is saved, and anybody, and that is confess it with their heart uh, and, and uh, uh, give themselves over to that, that Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is God's ruler. That man Jesus that was born in Bethlehem's manger is, is the king. So he identifies himself for us in Ezekiel 43. He says it'll be his throne and also the place of the soles of his feet. <coughs> Now, this is very significant because uh, one of the uh, uh, lesser themes, if there could be a lesser theme, is the fact that Messiah uh, will walk on the surface of the earth with the soles of his feet, that God will come and uh, be one of the inhabitants. He'll walk the face of this earth. And, of course, that's exactly what happened when Jesus came. God in Christ walked the face of this earth. The Old Testament prophets... Uh, said some rather startling things. For instance, way back in Genesis, in the third chapter, in verse 15, we're told uh, prophetically that the seed of the serpent would bruise the heel uh, of the seed of the woman, and the seed of the woman would bruise the head of the seed of the serpent. Now, if we followed these things all the way through, we'd find that the seed of the woman is Jesus Christ. He's the only human being that's designated in that manner because he had no earthly father. Uh, uh, we speak of Abraham's seed and we speak of David's seed uh, and, and so forth. But Jesus Christ is the seed of a woman. He's called that in uh, various places in the Bible. For instance, the, the theme of that is explained for us in the book of Galatians where it plainly says that seed was Christ. And also in Romans, in the book of Romans. So... Uh, 
he, in this, uh, this Genesis 3.15, the heel of the seed of the woman is going to be bruised, we were told, by the seed of the serpent. Now, the seed of the serpent is, uh, is the Antichrist and, or whoever Satan might be utilizing. And the, uh, the Antichrist is the uh, ultimate of a human being being taken over and used by Satan for Satan's purposes. But uh, there are many, uh, you might say, of Satan's seed. Remember, Christ said uh, to a group of the religious leaders of his day, you call Abraham your father? Well, ye are of your father the devil and the works of your father you will do. This is what he proclaimed to his religious, to the religious leaders. So what does this mean? That the seed of the woman would bruise the head of the seed of the serpent, but the seed of the serpent would bruise the heel of the seed of the woman. Well, it's a po this, uh, this uh, bruise the heel is a poetic way of saying will cause his walk on this earth to cease. Your sojourn on this earth in the Bible is called your walk. Your Christian walk is that, is that period of time from the day you were saved until you go home would be with the Lord. This phrase is used throughout the New Testament, for instance. Uh, it, uh, you are exhorted to walk in a certain manner. You'll find this frequently, for instance, in uh, Ephesians. Uh, you'll find it, uh, for instance, in, in 1 John. So our walk, see, remember the verse, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we... Uh, we shall have fellowship one with the other and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. So uh, this is the walk on this earth. Well, what this prophecy in Genesis 3.15 is saying that the walk of the Messiah will be see, it will cease, it will stop. And this is brought out again in the 53rd chapter of Isaiah where it says, He shall be cut off but not for himself. Or, or that's in that's in Daniel. In Isaiah it says, He shall be cut off from the land of the living without a progeny or without an earthly descendant. And uh, so uh, he's had his heel bruised. He had his heel bruised at Calvary's cross. It was at Calvary's cross that his walk as a human being ceased on earth. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 we're told that one day every other authority is going to be put under his foot and we're told that he's going to come back and walk on the face of the earth and that's the significance of this phraseology in uh, Ezekiel 43 7 and he said unto me son of man the place of my throne where I'm going to rule and the place of the soles of my feet he's going to walk on this earth and this uh, e expresses his his uh, 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 his uh, rulership and, and sitting on the throne and his right to be among us and one of us uh, in, his, in his walk upon the surface of the earth. And Jesus will walk this earth again. And the reason he was cut off, as Daniel the prophet says, not for himself, but for us, so that we might uh, walk eternally, so that our walk might not be restricted to this particular period of years uh, from the time uh, we come from the womb until the time we go to the grave. God wanted us to have a longer walk than that. And so that we could have a walk, his walk was cut off. But his walk is going to come again. And when he comes, he's going to come through the eastern gate of Jerusalem. And this is depicted here in the glory of God. Now, I, those of you that came last week, I asked you to read in Ezekiel or review the chapters uh, 10, 11, and 12 because it was in those chapters uh, that we see the glory of God leaving the temple. If you go back and, and read the account of the building of the, of the temple that's generally known as Solomon's temple, you will find as soon as it was built and dedicated by dedicatory prayer on the part of Solomon that the glory of God entered the temple with such brilliance that the priests couldn't even go in and minister. One of the places you'll find this is in uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 7. Another place would be in 1 Kings, I believe, chapter 8. Uh, and you'll see that the, God accepted the place of worship and the glory of God came into the temple. This was 900 and some years before Christ. And then about 600 and some years before Christ, the glory of God departed the temple. And it, this is, uh, and it was a very slow process. God uh, had his glorious presence there in the holy place, went first to the 
uh, to the temple door and then to the courtyard and then to the Mount of Olives, which is east of Jerusalem. The glory of the Lord departed and the glory of the Lord came back in the birth of Christ. But the glory was not manifested because Jesus came as a lowly one so that he might be identified with the very lowliest member of the human race. And his glory didn't sh shine forth. You had to see his glory with spiritual eyes. Except uh, uh, Peter, James, and John, when they went up on the Mount of Transfiguration, they saw the Christ in all of his glory there. And it, it was an astounding thing to them. Uh, you've read the account of it by, by the Apostle Peter just before he left this earth in Second Peter chapter 1. But when he comes back the next time, his glory is going to be manifested and what he's going to do, he's going to plant his feet on the Mount of Olives to the east of Jerusalem. Now, I want to give you a picture of that area, uh, 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 a mind's picture. Jerusalem uh, is uh, on a little series of hilltops between the Mediterranean Sea and the Dead Sea. And it's an, at an elevation of about 2,500 feet above sea level. And if you were to go, as the Bible says, a Sabbath day's journey east of the main little hill on which the temple sat, a Sabbath day's journey is a little over half a mile. If you were to go directly east from where the temple was, uh, a little over half a mile, you'd be on the top of another hill that was called the Mount of Olives or the Mount Olivet. Now, the Mount of Olives uh, rises about 200 and some feet higher in elevation than does the, the Temple Mountain or Jerusalem. So that if you uh, climb to the top of the Mount of Olives, which wouldn't be a prodigious task because it's not a steep mountain, neither is a very high mountain. I mean, it's not very high. Uh, 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 it's not high uh, in respect to the, the terrain around it. But if you were to stand on the top of the Mount of Olives and you turn your face due west and you look towards the west, you would be looking over the Garden of Gethsemane, which would be down on the slope below you. And then uh, just uh, to the west of that would be a brook flowing from the north to the south that's called in the Bible the Brook, brook Kidron or the brook, brook Cedron, which means the Brook of Cedars. It's dry most of the year, but in the rainy season it has water. And if you were to go there today and you look down the slope to the Garden of Gethsemane, here you are standing on the top of the Mount of Olives. You look down that slope to the Garden of Gethsemane where Christ uh, prayed, and then just below that, the little brooklet uh, uh, Kidron, and then there's a very steep rise up from that brook, and uh, uh, there's a cemetery now, and then just uh, above that is a great magnificent gate in the walls of Jerusalem. And if you looked up over the top of that gate, you'd see this dome, this uh, Muslim temple sticking up over that gate. Well, the present walls of Jerusalem were built about 400 years ago, 1500 and something, maybe 450 years ago, by a Turkish ruler. He built the walls that are around Jerusalem right now, if you were to go there. And uh, he put this magnificent gate towards the east. Now, the reason he made this gate uh, magnificent is because in Christ's time it was called the Golden Gate, and at other times it was called the Eastern Gate. It's the gate through which Christ marched. Uh, on what we call Palm Sunday, or on, in the triumphal uh, entry. He entered through the East Gate. He came from the Mount of Olives and entered through the East Gate. Now, this Turkish ruler uh, was, was building the walls, and he was finishing the walls with this ma magnificent gate to the east. And uh, the story goes that someone told him that they were pleased that he was making the gates so mag magnificent because one day soon a king that would be the king of all the earth, would come through that gate. And the story goes that he believed him. And uh, uh, he says, well, <laughs> we'll see about that. And so he immediately sealed the gate up. And if you were to go, and that's 400 and some years ago, but if you were to go there today and look, you'd see that great, magnificent eastern gate completely <laughs> sealed up uh, with wall after wall of stone, of, uh, of concrete. And uh, it's because this Turkish man says nobody's going to go through that eastern gate. Well, we're going to see that that's significant here after a while. But there it's been 
All the other gates in the walls of Jerusalem, people go in and out. But they don't go through the eastern gate, and nobody ever has gone through the eastern gate. Because today, 400 and some years later, it's still sealed up. And a lot of times, if you see a picture of Jerusalem anywhere taken from the Mount of Olives, and most of your Bibles probably have one in them, or any uh, Bible dictionary or something, uh, it, it'll be looking from the Mount of Olives, and you'll see this, this gate that's uh, all, uh, all uh, sealed up. It has been for some point, and no road goes to it because it's just sealed up, and that's why there's a cemetery in front of it, because nobody went that way, so I guess they thought it was a good place to put a cemetery. Anyway, there's, there's something very interesting about this east gate. When Jesus was here on earth, his disciples uh, learned about the Old Testament prophecies. And they knew that the Old Testament prophecies said that when the king, when the Messiah took over, he would come from the Mount of Olives and he would march through the eastern gate. And he would march triumphantly into the city. And their pulse beat a little faster every time he'd go that way. As a matter of fact, uh, you, can, uh, you can see one of those occasions in the book of Luke, chapter 19, if you want to. And this, uh, as you'll see, is not the only time it happened. Uh, Jesus had been in Galilee, and the main way to come up, uh, come from Galilee to Jerusalem was to come through the city of Jericho. And you'll remember, it, as he passed through Jericho, uh, he uh, healed blind Bartimaeus, and then uh, he had the uh, encounter with uh, the little Zacchaeus up in the sycamore tree. And uh, when he said, uh, Zacchaeus, come down, well, the story of Zacchaeus is in the first ten verses of Luke chapter 19. And then uh, they proceeded on the highway from Jerusalem and from Jericho to Jerusalem. Now, that's not very far. Probably as the crow flies, it's probably less than 15 miles. But it's a steep ascent because Jericho, you may know, is the lowest city in all the world. It's 800 and some feet below sea level. And Jerusalem's 2,500 feet above sea level. So you can see you've got to do some climbing in a short ways to go from Jericho up to Jerusalem. And this is where Christ and his disciples were going on this particular day. They just had their encounters, as I say, with Bartimaeus and also with Zacchaeus. Well, now, if you're going from Jericho to Jerusalem, you have to go right up over the top of the Mount of Olives or you have to skirt it around to the... If you don't want to climb up over the top of it, you skirt it around to the south side, kind of go over the south shoulder of it through the little village of Bethany where Mary and Martha and their brother Lazarus lived. So uh, uh, they were walking along there. And they just left Jericho, uh, see, in chapter 19, verse 1, and Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Then you have the story of Zacchaeus. And then in verse 11, and as they heard these things, he added and spoke a parable. And he's going to uh, speak a parable for a reason. Because he was nigh to Jerusalem and because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. And then he tells them a story about a nobleman going into a far country to receive a kingdom to himself. And it's his way of telling them that he's got to go away, far away, before he comes back and uh, asserts himself uh, as the king. Now, after he tells this story, you'll find this parable is recorded in verses 12 uh, on through verse 27. Now look at verse 28 of chapter 19. And when he had thus spoken, uh, he went before, ascending up to Jerusalem, and it came to pass, see, ascending up from Jericho, and it came to pass when he was nigh to Bethphage and Bethany at the mount called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying, go into the village. And this is the beginning of his triumphal entry. Well, he offered himself as king then, but he was rejected. But he knew he would be rejected. It's a preview of the time when he's going to come again. And the disciples thought this would be quite soon. They were very disappointed that he didn't manifest his kingdom at that time because he had already told them that each of those twelve would sit on twelve thrones ruling the twelve tribes of Israel. <laughs> And they were ready for a little bit of throne sitting after all of the ridicule and reviling they'd had. And so they wanted him to take over. I mean, now. <laughs> no, don't wait 2,000 years till uh, old Randy can get saved and Art and a few others, you know. We want, we want to sit on that throne now. 
uh, not later. And so uh, uh, they, they kept thinking it was the time. So when he was crucified and then resurrected, they thought, well, this is surely the time. And so in the first chapter of the book of Acts, we have an episode that happened 40 days after Christ was resurrected from the dead. Acts chapter 1. You remember, of course, that the Bible records 10 instances of Christ appearing on earth after he was resurrected. Appearing on earth uh, in his resurrection body. There's 10 accounts of that in the... Uh, in the scriptures, and we're told in 1 Corinthians 15 that on one occasion over 500 people saw him. Only saved people saw him uh, according to Acts 10.41. But look here in Acts chapter 1, and let's read a few words. Well, let's just start at the first. The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. Well, this former uh, treatise was the book of Luke, and now Luke's writing Acts until the day in which he was taken up after he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion, and we said ten times, by many infallible proofs, being seen of them by them forty days, and speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God, that is, forty days on earth after his resurrection, and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith, uh, which saith he, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days from now. Okay, they're going to ask him a question. Now, the, the reason they're going to ask this question is because of where they were. So let's read their question. Here it is in verse 6. And when they, that's the disciples, therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? You know why they ask him that question? It's because of where they were. Look at uh, uh, verse, uh, well, let's start with verse 10. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, and also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, who is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you've seen him go into heaven, then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a, a Sabbath day's journey. It's because they were standing with him right there on the top of the Mount of Olives from where all the prophets said he would enter Jerusalem and he'd been already died for their sins, he'd been raised from the dead, and they wanted to rule. They wanted the things to get going there. And so they said, look, everything's ready. Uh, uh, you've already suffered and died like the prophet said you would. You've been raised from the dead, and here we are, uh, ready to sit on our twelve thrones, and here we are on the Mount of Olives, and there's Jerusalem, and there's the Eastern Gate. Let's go, man. <laughs> this is time, you know. <laughs> so, and you know what happened, don't you? He, he went, but he went right straight up. <laughs> And they watched him go, and they were pretty downhearted till those ten, uh, those angels came and said, "You men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing here?" That's where he went up from. Well, that's particularly interesting. If you'll turn back to the book of Zechariah now, that's the next to the last book in the Old Testament. So find Matthew, go back to, and you got it. Um, uh, Zechariah chapter fourteen. Now, here you're going to have a prophecy about when Jesus comes back again. Now, I'm going to tell you a little story. Right soon after I was saved, you know, I thought the people with the most theological degrees would know more, most about, uh, you know, the Bible. And so uh, I was talking to one of these fellows. He, he's been through a pretty important seminary. And as a matter of fact, this particular fellow still does have, I'm not going to identify him, but he's big enough so his office covers a whole state, and he's in one of the major denominations. So he's a wheel theologically. So I thought he'd be a good, good guy to ask. So I went up to him, and I says, you know, I've been reading the Bible, and it seems to say a lot about Jesus coming back again. And uh, uh, what, what do you know about that? Isn't that going to be interesting? And he says, why, well, Don, he says, uh, he says, uh, what fundamentals have you been listening to? Fundamentalist you've been listening to? He says, 
uh, that's a spiritual thing. It says, uh, uh, when Jesus comes back, it means like uh, uh, he comes back every time somebody receives him into their heart. That's what it means, the second coming of Christ. I said, well, that doesn't sound just like uh, to me. And, and then says, this is what he said. He says, next time somebody talks to you about Jesus Christ coming back to this earth, literally, I'll tell you what you do. You say to him, yeah, where is he going to come back to? Your backyard? And that's what he told me. That's what he told me to ask the guy. Yeah, where is he going to come back to? Your backyard? Well, I didn't know then, but boy, I know now. I, I'd say, well, Zechariah said where he was going to come back to. 400 and some years, 500 and some years before he ever came the first time. And uh, here it is, right here in Je Zechariah 14. Verse 1, Behold the day of the Lord. Now, in the Old Testament, when you see the day of the Lord, it's talking about the Lord's day, with the, the day the Lord's going to come back and take over. That's what it means. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee, and I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. This is the battle of Armageddon. And the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravaged, and the uh, half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations at the uh, battle of Armageddon as he fought in the day of battle. Now look at it here, verse 4. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst of it. That's whose backyard. He's going to land in. Whoever's backyard's on the top of the Mount of Olives, that's the one. And uh, it's, uh, I didn't know that then. See, I was a brand new Christian. Uh, but uh, if, if he told me that now, asked me that now, I could tell him. Maybe I will yet. I still know where he is. Uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, you, can you see now why these disciples, they believe they weren't like this fellow. They believed what the Bible said. And they believed, these disciples, they believed that Jesus Christ was going to literally, in a human body, plant his feet, the soles of his feet, just like old Ezekiel says, just like Zechariah says, the soles of his feet were going to walk on the face of this earth again. And that's going to happen now, whether I believe it or whether you, I believe it, but whether anybody else believes it or not, that's what's going to happen. The soles of his feet are going to walk on this earth, and they're first going to touch down exactly where they left up from the last time his physical feet touched this earth. They're going to come right back to that same spot. And that's the way God does things. See, he told us where he's going to come back to before he ever left from there. Sure is interesting how ignorant some smart people are. So, This, then, is Ezekiel's vision of Christ coming back to this earth to rule, and not only sitting on his throne, but walking the face of this earth by the soles of his feet. And he says when he does that in the seventh chapter, that the children of Israel aren't going to worship their kings anymore. You know, one form of idolatry uh, was to worship a king king after he's dead. Now, while he was alive, they fought him tooth and toenail. But not too long after he was dead, they began to worship him in his tomb and so forth. You know, that's we do about the same thing now. Uh, uh, take a poor old fellow like Nixon. Uh, if uh, he gets worse and happens to pass out of this picture, it won't be hardly any time for half of the people that uh, that's telling what a, a, a terrible guy he is now. Uh, they'll be... Uh, uh, idolizing him, or, or so forth. That's how we do it, you know. And the, and the longer in the distance past somebody lives, the, the uh, more righteous they get uh, because we, uh, we uh, make uh, idols out of them. Well, that's what, that's what the people of Israel was doing, and that's what he means here in the last part of this seventh verse when he says, "...and shall the house of Israel no more defile, neither they nor their kings by their whoredoms, nor by the carcasses of their kings in their high places." They buried their kings on the top of a hill like so they could go up there and, and worship. Verse 8, In the setting of their thresholds by my thresholds and their posts by my posts and the walls between me and them, they, shall even, they have even defiled my holy name by their abominations that they have committed. Wherefore, I have consumed them in my anger. He's speaking of uh, letting the, the nation of Israel 
being overrun by the armies of Nebuchadnezzar. Verse 9, now let them put away their whoredoms or harlotries and the carcasses of their kings far from me, and I will dwell in the midst of them forever, God says. And you see, what we have here is what is known as a theophany or a Christophany. This means a pre-incarnate appearing of Christ because that's who is appearing to Ezekiel at this time. Uh, he identifies himself and such. And of course, this is, as I said, 500 and some years before Christ came to this earth uh, at Bethlehem. Verse 10, Thou son of man, show the house to the house, show the house to the house of Israel. What he's really saying here, see, God has shown Ezekiel a description of this temple. And he says, now I want you to go to your people and paint them a mental picture of this that you've seen. I want you to describe it to them, in other words. And uh, no doubt what we have here in the book of Ezekiel is, uh, is Ezekiel's description as a result of this command. See, this Christophos, uh, Christophany or this appearance of Christ that Ezekiel says, now Ezekiel, I want you to describe this to your people. So he did. And that's why you have it written down here. Thou son of man, show or describe the house to the house of Israel, or the people of Israel, that they may be ashamed of their iniquities and let them measure the pattern. I want you to show you what I really have in mind for them. Something really glorious. And they defiled my holy name and they've spoken against me and I, I want... I want you to show them what I really have in mind and what they could have had if they would have yielded to me, and then they'll be ashamed. This is the same thing is going to happen to some of us, you know. Some of us don't think God treats us exactly right. We think that, that God could treat us in this world just a little bit better. We could have just a little bit more uh, uh, of, uh, of the good things and not so much of the, the trials and tribulations. And some of us, you know, down in the deep, dark recesses of our evil minds, uh, we kind of uh, fuss about how God treats us. Well, I'll tell you what, one day we'll be ashamed that we thought such things about a good and gracious God. He says in verse 11, And if, and if they be ashamed of all that they have done, show them the form of the house and the fashions of it and the goings out of it and the comings in of it and all the forms of it and all of its ordinances and all of its forms and all of its laws and write it in their sight that they may keep the whole form of it and all of its ordinances and do them. He says, what I want you to do, now note and get the picture here. They had a magnificent temple. God had to take it away from them because they defiled it and because they lived uh, in a sinful manner before a holy God. And so he says, but I don't have bad thoughts against you. I had to do this to protect the holiness of my name. I had to bring this judgment. But now, he says, I want you to show them that I'm going to give them another chance. And I want to sh you to show them, Ezekiel, what I have in mind for them in the future. And that's why he wanted that. And, and all the things to do with it. Verse 12. This is the law, or that is the instruction concerning. Law here means whatever God has to say. This is the law of the house upon the top of the mountain. Its whole limit round about shall be most holy. Behold, this is the law of the house. And then he describes here all of the things that will go on in that place of worship. Now, in uh, chapter 44, we want to talk a minute about this matter of the, uh, of the gate being closed. Chapter 44. Then he brought me back the way of the gate of the outward sanctuary which looks towards the east, and it was shut. Then said the Lord unto me, This gate shall be shut. It shall not be opened, and no man shall enter in by it, because the Lord the God of Israel hath entered in by it. Therefore it shall be shut. Now, of course, many people see in this matter of this gate in Jerusalem being shut for all these centuries uh, a direct... Uh, uh, answer to this prophecy. I don't know whether it's direct in the sense that uh, he's speaking primarily of the gate of the wall that happens to be over in Jerusalem right now. He's obviously referring primarily 
to the gate of the wall, of the gate of the temple that's going to be there during the millennium. But I don't have any doubt in my mind that the uh, closing of the gate that's there in the wall now and the fact that it's been closed all this time documents what's being said here. And, uh, and I, 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 frankly, I think that's why it's closed. It's to, it's to show people that are unbelieving that uh, right in the midst of themselves, in their day, if they look, they can see direct answers to Bible prophecy. And I don't know any reason in the world the main gate of a city should be uh, sealed up for 400 and some years. And, you know, Jerusalem's been under the dominion of just all kinds of peoples since then. You'd think, in one sense, the first thing that the Jews would do when they took over Jerusalem again uh, six, seven years ago was to go open that gate up, wouldn't you? But they didn't. They didn't. Still closed. Go on over and look at it. It's closed. Tight. Never been opened. Now, verse 3. It is for the prince. Now, notice the two words, it is, are in italics. The language in the next two or three chapters would indicate, would seem to indicate, that this personage called the prince is going to go in and out this gate. But every time you see the, they talk about the prince, it talks about the porch of the gate. Evidently, in this millennial gate, this uh, great uh, gate that's going to be there during the millennium, there's going to be a great, magnificent archway and then sort of a little portico on either side uh, so that only the most important people, in this case, actually only the Messiah, can go through the main gate. Then there will be lesser gates where his lieutenants and so forth can enter on the side, and, and it, it speaks of those as the porch of the gates. And if you read carefully uh, through these chapters, you will see a difference between the gate itself and the porch of the gate or that which is called here the porch of the gate. Now, who is this prince? First, let's look at the third uh, verse again of this 44th chapter. Let's leave the it is out, because it's not in the original. It's out italicized if you have a King James Bible, and that means that uh, those words were supplied by the translator because he thought it would help clear up the meaning for you. And always, when you see italicized words in the King James, you should read the passage both with and without those words, because sometimes they confuse the issue rather than to clarify it. And I've said before, one of the reasons that I like the King James Version is because when these people that, that brought the King James Version to us supplied words, they let you know it. And the modern versions don't do that. They do the same thing because you can't, you can't put one language into another one exactly. It won't fit. Some words have to be supplied to give the sense and the meaning. And many times when the, the translators of the King James supplied those words, it does help clear up the meaning, and it's helpful. But at least they let you know when they did, and I like to know that. It's one of the reasons I like the King James Version. I want to know when they put some words in there because they thought it would help my understanding. In this particular case, I think it would go better without them. I think it should be for the prince, or as for the prince, the prince shall sit in it, sit in it, sit in the gateway, that is. And, and this is explained through the passage here. And shall go out by the way of the same. Then brought he uh, me to the house of the north gate before the house, and I looked, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the place. Now, who is this prince? Well, I think there's about four words, Hebrew words, in the Old Testament that are translated by our English word prince. In the book of Ezekiel, the word is used, the word prince is used quite a number of times, and it always comes from the same original word, which simply means a personage of rank. Now, sometimes when the Old Testament says prince, it means whoever was the chief priest at the time. Other times, it, it means people who ruled underneath the main ruler. For instance, in the book of Daniel, when it speaks of the princes, it means those who had a province instead of the whole country, something like that. Uh, so the prince uh, in the in the um, prince in the Old Testament doesn't always mean the same thing, but in Ezekiel, it always means the same thing. And what it means is a person of notoriety, a personage of renown. Now, some people feel like it means 
the Messiah, and he could be called a personage of renown, and that's why they put it is for the prince here. But this prince in Ezekiel cannot be the Messiah, and I'll show you why. Look in uh, uh, chapter 45, verse 22. And upon that day shall the prince prepare for himself and for all the people of the land a bullock for a sin offering. Now this uh, leads some to believe that this prince is the high priest or the one who offered sacrifices. And it's emphasized throughout the scriptures, both Old and New Testament, that a prince, that a, a priest always had to offer sacrifices for himself to show that he was sinful before he was permitted to offer sacrifices for the people. As a matter of fact, the two sons of Eli in the fourth chapter of uh, Samuel lost their lives. First cha fourth chapter of 1 Samuel lost their lives because they didn't take care of their own sins before they uh, tried to offer uh, a holy sacrifice for the sins of the people. They were priests in the office. And... Uh, uh, they didn't stay priest because uh, uh, they got bumped off because they weren't doing, uh, they weren't regarding God's work right. And uh, uh, they didn't stay around too long. But anyway, this is a truth. Now, if you want to see the New Testament explain it, hold your place in Ezekiel and go to the book of Hebrews, chapter 5. This, I think, is significant in helping us to understand why some would say that this prince is the high priest. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 1. For every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God. Now, it's explaining what a high priest is. The Bible def defines what a high priest is. It defines what a prophet is. If you look, it'll define uh, what's meant by a particular term. And it says a high priest is a man taken from among men and he... Uh, is ordained to do something for men. Ordained for men in things pertaining to God that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way for he himself also is compassed with infirmity and by reason of this he ought as for the people so also for himself to offer for sins. You see, he ought not to offer sacrifices for others until he offers a sacrifice for himself. This is talking about a human, uh, normal human being that is designated as a high priest. And this would give rise to the fact that the prince here in Ezekiel is the high priest. Now, I don't know that for sure. There's at least four uh, predominant thoughts. One is that it's Messiah. I don't believe that. There's a uh, considerable of the language, just won't let it be the Messiah. Some say it's David. Well, I don't believe the glorified David, uh, having left the teary veil of a sinful body behind a long time ago, I believe he's going to be uh, himself personally in the millennium, but I don't believe he'll be offering sacrifices for his own sin. So I don't think that fits him either. Some say it's a direct descendant of David uh, who will be sitting on the throne, but I think David will be the human person sitting on the throne. So I think the most logical c conclusion is the prince here, the, the, the person of note is uh, the uh, head man as far as the worship procedure is concerned, and he'll be a, a flesh and blo bones uh, mortal man that's uh, uh, among the priesthood at that time. You'll see if you read this section that a particular portion of land was set aside for him. There's much about the priest, I mean the prince, in these chapters. And as best I know, that's who he is, but you won't be able to get an argument with me about it because I'll tell you, you might be right. And, and then that'll stop the argument. Won't it? Now, in this section, all through 43, 44, 45, and 46, you're going to see the worship procedures for the millennial age, and we're not going to uh, go verse by verse through this portion. You can read it for yourself. I don't understand a lot about it. It's primarily written for the people of another day, primarily. But one of the wonderful things about God and his Bible is he puts a juicy morsel for you interspersed all among the portions that he writes 
primarily for somebody else. Now, we've seen this all through Ezekiel. We've seen that Ezekiel was written primarily for the Jewish people of a particular time and then some of the others for the Jewish people of another time. But there have been some real juicy things in here, haven't there? And we've got two more terrific passages before we can leave it. We're going to be, uh, next week, we're going to be in this uh, chapter 47. And you'll notice uh, this is the one where the river uh, of water, we'll just read a few verses here so maybe we can whet your appetite. Uh, look at verse 3. And when the man that had the line in his hand went forth eastward, he measured a thousand cubits, and he brought me through the waters. The waters were to the ankles. Again, he measured a thousand and brought me through the waters, and the waters were to the knees. Again, he measured a thousand and brought me, uh, through, uh, brought me through the waters were to the loins. Afterward, he measured a thousand, and it was a river that I could not pass over, for the waters were risen, waters to swim in, a river that could not be passed over. And he said unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen this? Then he brought me and caused me to return to the brink of the river. Now, the Bible has much to say about God's river, the river of God. There's a psalm about the river of God. And we're going to see what uh, we can find in the Bible for us about the river of God and what the river of God is as far as you're concerned. And that'll take us just about a whole lesson. And uh, it's, um, it's pretty good. Uh, it gets me all excited. So if you want to see me excited, we'll come back to, uh, next, uh, next week. Then, for our final study in Ezekiel, I'll give you a little preview there so that uh, uh, you can make your plans for two weeks from now. Uh, we're going to be centering on this theme Ezekiel 48, now look at the very last verse. We'll, uh, we'll take up some of the other matters, but we'll concentrate on this last verse, verse 35 of Ezekiel 48. It was round about 18,000 measures, and the name of the city from that day shall be, The Lord is there. Or another translation would be, The Lord is ever present. Uh, forevermore, God is going to be among his people. Now, in the Old Testament, we've learned before that God is known by several names, and the different names connote a different aspect of his essence of the, or his being or of his manifestation towards man. And one of those names of God is Jehovah, which is the name of God as he has direction towards humanity. It's God as he deals with us. That's Jehovah God. This is why some people say the Jesus of the New Testament is the Jehovah of the Old Testament. The Jehovah of the Old Testament is the Jesus of the New Testament because Jehovah is God as he has to do with us. He's God as we see from God towards us. As uh, uh, in one of the other names of God, uh, El Shaddai, it's us towards God. You see. And... Uh, uh, in the Bible, there are seven compound names of Jehovah. Now, Jehovah is in each of these seven names. But uh, this tells us seven different aspects of God's relationship to us. We're going to find something very uh, strange about this because in some of the cases, the names are translated for us in English as this one is. Now, those of you that have a marginal Bible, if you look uh, in your margin for the little... See, I have an O here by the Lord. The Lord is there, and there's an O there. If you look in the margin, and you'll see something that looks like Jehovah Shammah. How many of you have that in your margin? Jehovah Shammah. All right. That word Jehovah Shammah, it, what it means is the Lord ever-present, or the Lord is ever-present, or the Lord is there. Now, in some of the, uh, the passages, the the... Jehovah name is not translated. In some of them, instead of saying, uh, translating, the Lord is there, it would just say Jehovah Shammah. And what we're going to do uh, next, uh, two weeks from now, we're going to follow through on these seven names of Jehovah. The, uh, they start clear back in Genesis, and they go from Genesis to Ezekiel here. This is the seventh out of the seven. And we're going to see how these seven names of Jehovah relate to us. And uh, we'll learn something about God 
we'll run some little goodies that we might not really know now. And I think you'll enjoy this. Seven compound names of Jehovah. That is, God as he has to do with people. And ultimately, what God is going to do in regards to people, he's going to be ever-present among us. That's the seven. Now, we're building up to that, you see, in six steps. So you might want to know where you are along the way, because right now, God is not present from the standpoint that uh, you have a complete, full concourse with him. Now, I know he's here all the time, but if you're like most of us, sometimes God seems like he's pretty far away, I mean, in our comprehension. He just, he, you just sort of would like uh, to, to uh, touch him, you know. Well, one day God is going to be right among us. You know, like the little kid every time Daddy would go put out a light and pretty soon the kid would start uh, crying in bed. Daddy, it's dark! And uh, so uh, pretty soon Daddy, uh, she, Daddy says to the little girl, says, Well, I can't stay here all night with you, honey. And she says, Well, I want somebody to be with me. And he says, Well, God's with you. He says, Yeah, but I want somebody I can touch. <laughs> so... <laughs> Uh, well, someday uh, you can touch him because God in Christ. You'll understand God in every single aspect and he'll be just as close as a human being could possibly be. You'll be God is there. God is always right there in, in the fullest of manifestation. And maybe if we build those seven steps, you see, you, you'll see where you are at least as far as your understanding or your revelation of God, you'll see how far uh, you are along your journey. And I think it'll be interesting. So uh, that'll be two weeks from the night. And then you pray with us and let's see, three weeks from the night's Thanksgiving. Yes, sir. What happens that day? No one has to study, right? I don't know. That, that's up to the main people to decide. But anyway, uh, the next time after we get through Ezekiel, y'all pray with me and we'll see what the Lord has for us after that. So let's pray now. Lord, thank you again for this time together. And we pray that you'd continue to open up the scriptures that we might know and understand our God. In Jesus' name, amen.